Well, I'm here with my very special guest, uh, Chris <laughs> Beck. How are you, sir? I'm good. How are you, Robert? I'm very good. For those of you who have not seen the credits of my podcast, Chris is my producer, as well as a very good friend of mine. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating. <laughs> I'm actually a guest of my own podcast, know, so that's kinda, great. Kind of bizarre here. Yeah. Um, it is a little bit incestuous, but I think you're actually a very interesting guest for a number of reasons, so uh, we'll get into that in a second. But before we do that, we're here at the IBL activation at South by Southwest. Have you had a chance to kind of make your rounds yet? I have. Uh, I went last night and had a great time. Um, the Ibel installation here is amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're not, if you're at South by Southwest, please stop by and check it out. It's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it's great. So, um, one of the reasons why I think you're great is because you really understand a lot about Hollywood, and Hollywood, I think, is sort of the center of gravity of a lot of things that are happening in society in general. And um, so, kind of get started. I want to get your bona fides a little bit and talk about your credentials, just just so that people know who you are and why you're not just some producer off the street, you're, you're somebody that has done this a lot. Can, right. you, can you talk about that a little bit? Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, I've been in the industry for 33 years. Um, I started at uh, Walt Disney World. The first job I ever had was the grand opening of Disney MGM Studios two-hour NBC television special. That was uh, 1990, 1989, something like that. Ugh, I age myself. <laughs> anyway, um, so I did that. For, I, I was in Disney for about six years, and I basically produced everything that came into Disney Studios. So it, it was a, I was able to get the kind of experience that uh, a lot of people you know dream of. So I did commercials. I did music videos. I worked on the movie Oscar with Sylvester Stallone. Um, I worked on a show called Thunder in Paradise with Hulk Hogan. Um, I, I got an opportunity to do a lot of things. Florida was a right to work state at the time. So I worked in all the departments as well. I did um, art department, locations, production coordination, craft service. Um, I, I got an opportunity to do everything. And that was fascinating to me. So, so six years in Florida, and then it took me to California. So when I got to LA, um, I started doing uh, a bunch of different films. I did The Out of Towners. Mm -hmm. uh, I did uh, with Goldie Hawn and Steve Martin. Uh, Devil's Advocate with Keanu Reeves. I have some amazing stories about that That's one. That's a good movie. Yeah, it's a good movie. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, you know, several other films. And, you know, I, I've been in L.A. for 28 years. So uh, my sort of claim to fame, I suppose, would be uh, I produced James Cameron's Underwater documentaries mm -hmm. from 2000 to 2005. Who? James Cameron, <laughs> you know, Just... Avatar, Titanic, you know, little movies. He's probably you know, the he's... most well-known director, I think. Yeah, um, yeah, that's what I hear. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I did five years with Jim Cameron, but I've known, I've been in the family's, uh, you know, circle for 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, when I left Jim, I went to go start a new division of Entertainment One Television, E1. And uh, I was the vice president of production for E1 for six years. And uh, E1 specialty is? E1, uh, the division we started was nonfiction, uh, reality, and docu-series. So it's your fault. Yeah, it's my fault. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Reality TV is my fault. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, so I did that for six years. And you know, basically, it was myself and Tara Long. Uh, we, we were the only two that started the division. And then in the six years that we were there, we've created probably about 400 to 600 hours worth of television with multiple series like Growing Up Hip Hop and, uh, you know, Fameless with David Spade. And, you know, there's, I don't know, there's a lot of, I'd actually have to read my own resume to tell you all the shows I worked on. Mm -hmm. uh, so then after I left E1, I went to do the Olympics. I did a show called uh, uh, Scouting Camp, the next Olympic hopeful. Yeah, it was great. I like USOC. that. USOC. Yeah. yeah. We, I wish uh, they had made another season of that. It was um, pretty yeah, it was amazing. Uh, yeah. we, we discovered a bunch of Olympians that actually went on to, uh, and, the gentleman, uh, one of our guys, won a bronze in bobsled. So, uh, and these are not these are not Olympic. No, no, people. They, they're usually just randoms off the street. Basically. Oh yeah, yeah, they were from uh, you know like LA Fitness ran a, a program for you know anyone who was working out at the gym that wanted to be an Olympian, come on down, kind of thing. So we did. I did that, and then um, another couple of years of uh, you know various movies, reality shows, TV. Uh, but in 2019, I was the production executive on a movie called The Green Knight. Mm -hmm. uh, Dev Patel, Alicia Vikander. Mm, that was a great movie. Uh, spent about five months in Ireland. And I, I have to say, Ireland is an amazing country. It's, it, it was one of the best uh, shoots I've ever been on my entire life. Mm -hmm. I so, bet. Uh, yeah. And also, it was just, it was kind of an interesting 
it added a lot to the aesthetic. You know, a lot of Hollywood, they kind of they kind of put fog machines in instead of it just being oh, a foggy well, day. No, the, the, <laughs> the Green Knight was, uh, we were there, and, and actually uh, a lot of production gets upset when it's raining. We were hoping for rain because pretty much most of the movie is, you know, Depp Patel with a giant axe on his back trudging through the marshlands of Ireland. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we di I did that, uh, and then I came back, and um, in uh, 20, let's see, what was it? March 14th, 2020, I was doing a show called Ghosted for MTV. So uh, on March 14th, they shut us down and because of the pandemic. So uh, I, you know, March, April, uh, beginning of May comes, and uh, I get a call from uh, James Cameron's brother, John Cameron. Mm -hmm. John had a tech company called the Human Health Organization. So John said, Chris, you know, Jim called, we need PPE and we need testing for avatars two and three. I'm like, okay, let's do it. So I jump on board as a chief operating officer and uh, we, Jim, Avatar 2 and 3 were actually the first two shows that were up and running during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, May, June, July-ish, uh, 2020. Um, then uh, the next client we had was Netflix. Then the next client we had was Lionsgate. Lionsgate bought a lot of tests for all of their shows, both scripted, unscripted, features, TV, the whole thing. So now the Human Health Organization, instead of doing tech, had transitioned into uh, COVID you know, protocols. Mm -hmm. And w as it turned out, we were one of the top companies in all of uh, California doing testing. And we only tested Hollywood shows. So um, you know, we, my, myself and my staff were on set for at least 1,500 different productions, all kinds, commercials, nonfiction. You know, we did Apple, Netflix, Hulu, you know, everybody. So um, I have a, another, you know, I have a little bit more experience with dealing with COVID protocols. I imagine so. Yeah. So one of the cool things is now you and I have kind of had a similar experience where we both moved from California to Texas. Yeah. You're a recent, you're the, you're the new transplant. You're the yeah. new guy in the block. Yeah, I, uh, I moved to uh, Austin, Texas on January 6th this year. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what first impressions? What, what do you think um, so far? First impressions. First of all, Austin's a great city. Mm -hmm. uh, beautiful people. Great food. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> you're a gorgeous guy. Uh, great food. Um, really, you know, it, it, it's like it's a big city in a small town, mm -hmm. and I, I really appreciate that. And uh, you know, yes, I know there's traffic, but yeah, it's not like LA. So you know, <laughs> I, I really enjoy that. Yeah, <laughs> gas prices are half the price in LA. I mean, yeah. it's like seven bucks in LA now, yeah. but uh, I really enjoy Austin. Yeah, I noticed something kind of interesting when I moved here. Um, I actually noticed something similar when I moved from Southern California to Northern California. Northern Californians seem to think Southern Californians are kind of uh, all about who you know, whereas Northern California, it's more about like what you do. You know, you, it's like what like you're talking what, Silicon Valley. Yeah, 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 in that area. Um, it's funny because when I moved to Texas, I had sort of the same kind of weird epiphany. It's like, well, Texas, there's sort of, everyone's just super nice, like incredibly nice, to the point where when I first started going out, like people would help me, and I just was sure they were trying to rob me, you know? Like I was <laughs> yeah. like actually putting my hand on my wall, like, uh-oh, here it comes. <laughs> it was a very bizarre experience. Yeah. But I think L.A. has got a kind of a bad rap about that. Um, it's so my my one claim to fame about this at all, and this this should show this is not a good story. Um, I was in a grocery store and uh, somebody had left their shopping cart in the middle of the aisle, and I'm like, "What asshole did this kind of thing?" And it turns out it was John Corbett, and John Corbett behind me said, "Oh, I'm so sorry," and I recognized his voice before I saw him because I'd watched Northern Exposure, and I'm like, ah, I didn't even want to turn around because I knew who it was, and he turned around. Yep, sure enough. And he's super nice and very gracious, and it, and it just occurred to me like, I, these are people, these are normal people, yeah. and and I, I have no reason to think of them any different than I think of you or anybody else I might know. Sure. But I think a lot of people in Northern California look at Southern Californians as sort of this weird collective of who you know and not who you are. Right. Like, what, what's your experience? Well, I mean, you know, 33 years in Hollywood, you know, you, you learn a few things, I suppose. And, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it is all, you know, I, I won't say it's all, but it's who you know. Sure, it's called networking. Um, but you also <laughs> have to do a good job, too. I mean, yeah. uh, I used to have people ask me, what kind of producer are you? And I'm like, what? I, he's like, well, you know, what producer are you? I'm like, I'm the one that works for a living. I, I come in before everybody else and I leave, you know, I, I'm the last one to leave. Um, for years, for about 15 to 20 years, I'm a line producer. 
So a line producer, if, for those audience that doesn't know what a line producer does, um, you have above the line, which are directors, actors, writers, you know, all the creative. Mm -hmm. And below the line, you basically have the crew, the camera, the grip, electric sound. There's a line in the budget that is basically, you know, separates the above and the below. The line producer is the line. So I, uh, even though that it's not technically a creative position, uh, I'm not technically crew either, but I have to manage both. So budgets as well as personnel issues. Personnel, and... vendors, budgets, insurance, legal, all of it. You know, I, mm -hmm. I am basically. You're the CEO of the project. Yeah, the, yeah pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, the director is, well, maybe, the, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, however you want to frame it, that's fine. <laughs> I don't want to get you in trouble with director friends. No, that's all right. That's all right. Yeah, they, they question that. <laughs> so. What does it take to be successful? I mean, you've had a very historic career in many different ways, but someone just getting started in their career, you know, maybe they're an intern, maybe they're working the camera, maybe they're trying to work their way up and get into Hollywood. What, what does it take to actually be successful from the ground up? Um, well, personally, I, I can speak to my, you know, what I've done is uh, sure. it is networking. And um, I used to tell, uh, you know, up and comers, I was a, uh, I used to guest lecture at UCLA Film School, USC Film School, and I talked to the graduating class and they would want to know, well, what's it like out in the real world? Well, I, I would basically start by saying, you know, who wants to work at Starbucks? Nobody raised their hand. And who wants to you know, work in the film and television industry? And everybody raised their hand. I said, great. You know, about a quarter of you are going to be working at Starbucks if you don't pay attention. <laughs> so... Um, for me, you know, for me, it's uh, you need your first show. Get your first show. PA, PA is an entry level position. You can, you know, run. It's a go for coffee, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. So if you can get into as a PA, then you'll start learning and you'll start meeting people. So w w the way I did it was I PA'd for several years in various different departments, so I could learn each of the different departments. While I was doing that, I was making friends. So um, for those who are starting out in the film business, you you need to work hard, do a good job and make a lot of friends. And, and then, you know, as you keep growing, you'll start figuring out what you want to do and how you want to do it. And how did you do it? Um, well, uh, I, uh, I got the opportunity to work with Jim Henson and the Muppets. So mm -hmm. I worked with Jim before he died. And um, so Jim was uh, this amazing spiritual and, you know, just a power, just a force. So um, his producer was Martin Baker, and Martin was equally as powerful as Jim was. So Martin said to me, uh, Chris, I need you to start, you know, what you're doing here on this show, um, you should do for the next 10 years of your life. And I was like, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, if you want to do what I do, then you should, you need to work in each department on one show, a commercial, a music video, uh, whatever, all of it. Um, and you need to do that for the next 10 years. And I guarantee you, you will be one of the best producers in Hollywood if you follow that pattern. Now, Martin uh, won multiple enemy, Emmys. And, <laughs> he probably and, got that enemies, too. <laughs> enemies too, yeah. He won multiple Emmys and, you know, it was Jim Henson, of course, the Muppets. So um, he had a lot of uh, acclaim. Mm -hmm. So I followed his lead and uh, 10 years later, uh, I was a production supervisor working on a movie called Spy Hard with Leslie Nielsen. And I finally felt like uh, I had a real good grasp of the so it's industry. really just hard earned work hard earned work yeah correct it's, there's nothing there's no magic pill you can't just wake no up one as, day. as you know unless, unless you're, you're happen to be born into but, one of families yeah unless you're not, the same machine or yeah, something. yeah well that's the that's the <laughs> other fun part of this industry is that you know if you have relatives in it uh use them yeah okay yeah. um you know uh, uh, that nepotism is pretty gross it's gross but i'm gonna I, I hate to say this but it's real but you gotta use you it. use you use what you got you gotta use the tools in front of you correct yeah, not my style, but uh, you, I write my own tools. How about that? <laughs> there you go. Well, you have a different industry than I do. Uh, definitely, so. definitely. So I think you're an interesting person for a number of reasons, and one of those is because you are a line producer. So you really do get to see the economics of how these deals are made, as well as how the sausage is made under the hood. You know, someone gives you a budget, you really have to go make this thing happen within that budget, within this time frame, and. That is, there's a lot of things I think you have to do to make that occur that may not be as wonderful as people wish it would was. I mean, I think a lot of, there's a lot of bodies buried out in the desert kind of thing yeah, in this industry. 
I'm like, not telling. No. <laughs> Signed an NDA on that. Yeah, but I feel like in the industry, you kind of have to decide how much you're willing to do to get ahead. Is that kind of your impression from working with these people? Like, there's a lot of sociopaths who just kind of end up doing this and just kind of have to make it happen? Well... Because you don't strike me as a sociopath. No, no, no. I, I'm a... You're a very empathetic I, person. In many I ways. have a work ethic, and, you know, I, I come from Reading, Pennsylvania, and, you know, I, I, you know, I come from a good family. So, um, I, you know, Hollywood changes people sometimes. So you have to just, uh, you know, roll with it. But for me, I've always kept my grounded, you know, I kept my feet on the ground. And uh, I tried to learn the business of show business first. Mm -hmm. And that was, a, uh, I got another, uh, more advice from other friends in the business that said, show business is about economics. It really is. I mean, yes, you know, the creative, you know, controls the storyline and, mm -hmm. and, you know, shows what you're going to shoot. But you need the money to make the creative. Sure. So for me, it's, it literally is, um, I find that economics and creative go hand in hand. They walk together on the same path. Mm -hmm. Well, you certainly control the purse strings, so that makes it easier. <laughs> well, yeah, but, but you also have, to, you know, like, for example, working for James Cameron. Mm -hmm. um, he is not the easiest person in the world to work with. Oh, yeah? I haven't heard. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it took me about a year and a half to figure out what... Let's, you, hear, let's, hear, a good, let's hear a good story. Oh, good story. Well, okay. Uh, you're going to love this one. So uh, five years working for James Cameron. I got fired four times. Uh, three of the times had nothing to do with me because I just happened to be in the line of fire. Mm -hmm. But the fourth time had everything to do with me. And um, so uh, let's see. I, I have to kind of jump back just a little bit. So um, I'm, I'm, I became best friends with John Cameron, Jim's brother. So John and I were thick as thieves during these uh, documentaries we were doing. So um, I just got back from Portugal, and uh, we were just finishing up uh, Aliens of the Deep um, for uh, Disney. So I got back from Portugal, and um, actually, no, wait, it wasn't Aliens. I apologize. Uh, see, this is my resume. I, 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 you know, everything kind of just blurs into one year, you know? Uh, let's see. We did Ghost of the Abyss, Aliens of the Deep, Expedition Bismarck, Last Mystery of the Titanic, in that order. So we just finished Ghost of the Abyss, and I was coming back from Portugal, and um, I got a call, I got a message on my answering machine, which we had answering machines back then, mm -hmm. and it was John Cameron saying, hey, Chris, give me a call. I said, okay, great. So I pick up the phone, and I call JD, we call him JD, John Cameron's JD, and uh, JD said, Chris, uh, I need you to meet Jim in Nice, France, Saturday at, at 12 noon. I said... Uh, I'm, I just landed. I'm, I just got back from Portugal. What are you talking about? This is a Thursday. So he says, yeah, listen, this is what's happening. You need to do this. I booked you a flight already. I'm like, that means I have to leave like today. Yeah, okay. Don't unpack. Just take your stuff <laughs> with you. So uh, I rush back to the airport, get on a plane, plane, and I go to Nice, France. So I land. It's Friday afternoon, give or take. So um, I just, no hotel bookings, no transportation, nothing. I just had a ticket. And they told me to go and call me when you get to Nice. So I went, got a hotel. Uh, I called John and say, John, I'm in Nice, France. Where am I meeting Jim? And he goes, great, write this address down. So I write this address down. And um, I go down to the front desk to ask the ladies at the front desk, where is this address? You know, because, you know, this was in 2002. So we didn't really have the kind of technology, the phones and the GPS and all that stuff. So the ladies at the front desk were very helpful. They opened a map of France and they were showing, you know, they were looking for the town I'm supposed to meet Jim at. And they finally found it. So uh, if anyone's familiar with geography of France, you know, uh, Nice is like up here somewhere. Uh, Paris is over here. Marseille's down there. So um, I, the, the ladies found the town. And they go, oh, EC, EC, which means here in French. So um, I'm looking at that. I'm, I'm like, well, where are we? And they go, uh, okay, we are here. You need to go here. <laughs> Opposite side of the country. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'm in Nice, and I need to go to Marseille. Mm -hmm. And I, I have to admit, I was a little upset at John at the time <laughs> because I, I don't know what the hell was going on, why they sent me to Nice. And I have now, uh, as a producer, you have to think on your feet. You have to be quick, and you, you really have to, you know, solve problems. 
So um, I asked the ladies, I'm like, how do I get into Marseille by tomorrow morning before, you know, uh, if I leave tonight? Because I, I couldn't really take a flight because of just the way the times worked. So one of the ladies said, my father's a farmer. Um, there is a train that goes all the way around France. It's an agriculture train. Mm -hmm. And she said, I can get you on that train. It leaves tonight at 11 p.m. I said, OK, great. Put me on the train. So uh, I grab my stuff and I go to the train. And uh, it there's one car for farmers. It smells like cow shit, chicken shit. It's got feathers all over the place. And they, they don't have seats. They got wood benches. So, um, so I'm on the train. And I'm going around Nice. It takes about eight hours to get all the way to it down to Marseille. And it's horrible. I mean, it's, it's July, I'm sweating. It, the whole thing smells like cow shit. So uh, I see the sunrise in Marseille, and that's gorgeous. So I get there, I, uh, I grab a cab, only one cab out in front, and we take the cab, and I show him the address, and he goes, okay, no problem. So he takes me to the address, and it's a feed mill for animals. And I'm like, this can't be right. So we're driving around, driving around, and it keeps taking me to the same address. So the town had a little kiosk that said visitor center. So he <laughs> dropped me off there. I get on the phone. It's the middle of the night in uh, L.A. And I called John. I said, John, I don't know where I am. I'm, I'm here, but the address isn't. It's a feed mill. I'm in the center of town. Can you? What do I do? And he literally says to me, OK, great. Jim will be there in about an hour and hangs up. I'm like, how in the world do you know where I am? I told you, I, I don't understand how this works. I mean, I, didn't, I was just beginning with the Cameron, so I didn't really kind of get how they functioned. So I waited around, and literally, a 15-passenger van pulls up, door slides open, Jim, Susie, his wife, three kids. Jim looks at me and goes, hey, Chris, how was your trip? And I'm like, fine, Jim. So I get in the van. And uh, first of all, with Jim Cameron, you keep it very quick, very okay. short, and to the point, and try not to add any more words that don't need to be added. So I jump in the van, and uh, I'm sitting there next to uh, Josie, uh, Jim, one of Jim's daughter, little girl. She was like 10 years old. And Josie starts going, she's like smelling me. I mean, I smell like sheep shit. <laughs> I, I, I've been just riding a train for eight hours, you know, and rolling around in that stuff. So, uh, and then Susie slaps Josie on the arm and says, stop that, don't be rude. And he's, mommy, he smells. And Kids I, are honest. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we, we go back to that same feed mill, but there's a road behind the feed mill that I didn't see before. Uh, they open the gate, they go in, and Jim is nudging me in the shoulder going, wait till you see, wait till you see. And I'm like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing here, because no one told me what I was doing here. I was just meeting Jim. So we go in the back. We get to a warehouse. They open the door of the warehouse, and Jim is like a child. You know, he's like opening his presents. He's like, wait till you see what we got. Wait till you see what we got. So we go in, and I look at a warehouse as big as a Costco. And there are two submarines. There are four boats, four trucks. And shelves and shelves and shelves of, of underwater deep sea diving equipment. Jim looks at me. Now, this is the first time I have seen the two submarines, all the equipment, all this stuff. Or, or even knew they existed. Even know they existed. <laughs> no, you know, John gave me, you know, John gave me no information. So I uh, you know, uh, Jim looks at me and crosses his arms and says, So, how long is it gonna take you to ship? all of this stuff back to my ranch in Santa Barbara. And I'm looking at him going, you know I'm your production manager, right? <laughs> uh, I didn't say that. Uh, you never say that to Jim. I did not say that. But in my mind, I'm like, you got to be fucking kidding me. Really? So uh, again, knowing what I know about working for uh, James Cameron, sure. uh, I said to him, I, I, I put my hand on my chin, and I was like, you know what, can we walk around so I understand exactly everything's in here so I can get a better perspective of this? Jim respected that. He goes, yes, I understand why you're doing that, so let's do it. So Jim's showing me all this stuff, and the whole time I'm walking around the warehouse, all I'm saying is, fuck, 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 fuck. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. What the hell am I going to tell the guy? So we do this for like a good hour, hour and a half. And then uh, I, we go into the office, and, and Jim goes, so, so what do you think? Now, for me, I, I was like, I try to get as much time as I need. So uh, I told him, eight weeks. And he looks at me, and he slams his fist on the table and says, eight weeks? You have three. I'm like, 
okay. <laughs> so now you have three. So I'm now at three. <laughs> anyway, the, that's the that's James Cameron. I mean, you know, I I actually did it. I got it done in three weeks. But all right, getting back to how I got fired. Sure. This is how I got fired. So I did everything by the book. I mean, I it was. It was the way it should have been done because I had to deal with Interpol, I had to deal with the FBI, CIA, I had to deal with naval intelligence. You know, there's a lot of different people I had to deal with, so I figured it all out. Um, before that, uh, Jim sent me, he gave me a 13-page manifesto on how to ship the subs. He had written this up already. You know, and he just handed me, he, he said, follow these instructions and, it, and we'll take care, it'll be done. I'm like, okay, great. I, didn't, I looked at page one, I'm like, yeah, that ain't going to work. So I basically put that in a folder and I said, you know what, I'm just going to do this the way I need to do this. I figured it all out. So I, uh, so Jim calls me and says, hey, how's everything going? Are you on schedule? I'm like, yeah, we're on schedule, we're on time, everything's loaded, ready to go. Did you follow my protocols? I said, well, Jim, unfortunately, uh, there was a lot of things in your protocols I couldn't follow because of certain you know, legal rules and this, that, and the country of France, and et cetera, et cetera. There was silence on the other end. And then all of a sudden, he starts screaming at me on the phone. And I have to hold the phone out like this. <laughs> and he is saying, you MF. I mean, he was every slur in the book. He was so angry that I didn't follow his instructions, even though we're ready. I, three weeks it took me to do this. I didn't know how to do it. I figured it out. Um, and then uh, he rips the phone out of the a wall, throws it through the window of the office, Runs out of the office, gets in his uh, car, and starts doing donuts in the parking lot. I found this out later because Andrew, his producing partner, told me what happened. Um, and then uh, the final uh, call, the final words Jim said to me were, "Burn your passport. I never want to see you back in the United States." <laughs> so um, that was the fourth time I got fired. But here's the thing: but then uh, he rehired. He rehired. So what happened was <laughs> Andrew called me up after Jim freaked out and, uh, and says, Chris, tell me everything you told Jim. So I went through it all stage by stage. And Andrew was like, Chris, that's amazing. That's amazing that you were able to get it done so quickly and so like legally, legitimately. So he's like, I'll talk to Jim. Go take a week off in the south of France and have fun. I'm like, cool. I, and here's the thing is, I had seen Jim blow up before that, so I kind of knew that this will get, would get worked out. And then um, you and were, then, and, and then, then Jim so wrote me an email about two weeks later, and says, "Chris, you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. Thank you so very much. No one could have done a better job. Get your ass back here. We have a lot of work to do." Yeah. So there's your Jim Cameron story. So why don't you tell a quick story about how you and I met? Because I think that that's sure. kind of dovetailing into the actual of conversation course, here. Of course, of um, course. You know, this is just your bona fides. This these, is these leading are, up to I know, I was going to say, wow, what the, okay. <laughs> um, so uh, I was a vice president of production at E1. And um, Robert came in with Jeremiah Grossman and another fellow named Joe. And they were pitching us a reality show about hacking. And I thought, wow, this is great. I really want to do this. So uh, Robert, they all come in, sit down. Uh, Robert asked me, hey, what's your Wi-Fi password? And I said, well, it's on the wall. We actually had a piece of paper on the wall and said it. And he was like, okay, great. So, excuse me. So uh, Joe and Jeremiah start pitching the show. About 10 minutes go by. And uh, Robert flips his laptop around and shows me a mock-up of marketing campaign he had for the show. He's like, here's, here's what we think. Here's these images. You know, that we want to do this and this and this. And I'm looking at them and going, wow, that's really great. And then I look at the, the banners around it. I'm like, what is that? Where, where, where is this marketing thing? What did you do? Where is that? He goes, oh, I hacked your website. Now, Entertainment One Television is a half a billion dollar corporation out of Canada as big as Lionsgate. He hacked our website. Yep. Put, you you yep. hacked our website. Yes, I did. You put the uh, marketing campaign on the site and... I was like, okay, can you take it down, please? Because we're going to get into trouble for this. So Rob was like, oh, yeah, no, you said, yeah, no problem. I'll take it down. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the pitch continued, and we ended up buying the show. Mm -hmm. um, we went and pitched the show. Uh, nothing really transpired with it. But about two days later, we got an internal email from corporate in Canada saying, uh, we've been breached. Mm -hmm. We've been hacked. Change your passwords. Change this. Change that. The two development guys I was working with run into my office and go, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. Well, should we tell someone? 
and I'm like, no, don't say a word. <laughs> They're going to now find out in this podcast it was you that hacked E1. So, you know, get ready for the police to show up at your door. Anyway, that's how we met, and we've been friends ever since. Yeah, absolutely. So, a quick aside, why do you think Hollywood didn't want to do a show about hacking? Why do, why do you think that they're allergic to that idea? Well, um, w one of the pitches you guys had was uh, with MTV Viacom. Uh, the feedback we got was that Viacom Legal thought it would be a larger liability than an asset because they were afraid that you guys were doing a hacking show, they were going to get hacked. Mm. Just because that's kind of what you guys do. You like messing look with each other. Look what happened to Sony. No, yeah, they, look what happened they, to Sony. <laughs> exactly. So you guys keep messing with each other. So that's basically the feedback we got. I mean, everybody loved the show, but I believe they were all afraid of what it meant legally. I think that's really kind of a, a travesty yeah. um, because I think the show might have been good or might have been bad. I don't really care about that part. But the fact that Hollywood's afraid to take chances is almost the opposite of what you think. You think Hollywood's all about pushing boundaries and exploring human conditions and this next Well, when it comes whatever. to the story that's made up, sure. <laughs> but when it's in real life, oh, no. It's called risk assessment. <laughs> okay, I'm going to let that one go. <laughs> okay. So that's right around the time that I met John Cameron as well. Um, and I did a little work, uh, kind of a virtual CISO role with him, uh, for those who don't know what that is, uh, Chief Information Security Officer. And um, one of the things he was doing, which I thought was really interesting, was he had invented a cold vaporization technology, uh, along with Seamus Blackley, uh, who is the guy who invented the Xbox, actually. <clears throat> and the cool thing about it is, uh, for those of you who don't know anything about vaporization, the difference between smoking and vaping is really just comes down to how fast the molecules are moving around. So if you're, if you have two molecules and they're heated, they're moving really, really fast. They can hit each other. So they can start off as something fairly benign, and then they turn into ten things. Those ten things hit each other. Those turns into hundreds of things. So you might start off with something really relatively benign, like a tobacco leaf, end up with hundreds or thousands of different chemicals. With vaporization you're only slightly heating it up and turning it into a vapor and taking it in, so it's much less cancerous. Not to say there isn't any bad thing that can happen, but as far as consumer safety, it's, it's better, so maybe you don't drink it. Uh, but he had invented something that would just basically push it into your lungs as opposed to have, adding any heat at all. Right. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what you remember from those days? Like, what, what was uh, your experience with... Sure. Uh, well, first of all, um, obviously I work in film and TV. But I've been, you know, a loyal, trusted friend of the Cameron family for 20 years. So when John brought me in to help uh, with the vaping and technology, and, and me personally, I, I said to John, you know what, I'm not interested in vaping, but I'll run your company if you want me to. So that's kind of how it all started. Um, I'm not sure where else to go. Well, I, I think... Um... I think it's really kind of a shame. So for those of you who don't know, John passed um, last year. Uh, October 25th, 2020, John Cameron, Jim, James Cameron's baby brother died. Yeah. Our best friend. Yeah, he was a, he was a really, CEO. really, really amazing human being for all kinds of reasons. But I think his legacy, if I'm going to try to boil it down just to a few sentences, which is... I don't know. I mean, again, um, I don't really play a lot in politics, but I do... Why not? Um, why, why, is that, why is that an area you haven't focused on? Oh, I'm in politics. It's called Hollywood. Uh, different kind of Trust, politics. It's different kind of politics. But, you know, I mean, listen, I, I have problems focusing already. Mm -hmm. So I just want to focus on my lane. All right. So speaking of uh, politics of China in Hollywood, um, there's been a lot of really interesting things that have happened where China has said you have to have certain types of characters in your movies. You have to remove certain types of characters from movies. Um, in Red Dawn 2, the, the remake or whatever, they, uh, they had to change the bad, bad guys from Chinese to North Korean and, and all kinds of examples of this in Hollywood. Like, what are, you, what are you hearing on the street as far as how China is uh, doctoring the media? First of all, it's about economics. Okay? Again, it's about money. So uh, China controls you know, a billion people and the, the airwaves and what they see and how they see it. Um, it's a communist country, so they, they do what they do and they're allowed to do that. Now, uh, how Hollywood has to deal with that is that um, we censor ourselves based on what China asks us to do. 
Um, so you you won't see certain movies in China because of that censorship situation. I heard they only allow 34, I think, movies per year from the United States, and maybe that's even gone way down since then. Not, I'm not sure of that number, uh -huh. but um, if you know, if you if the if the U.S. Hollywood made a hundred movies a year that showed how great China was, you'd have a hundred movies a year. It wouldn't matter how many, as long as you don't uh, insult the Chinese people and the government or or change that you know what they're trying to do. Then you know we you can do as many movies as you want. I have a deal right now that I'm uh, trying to work out with a Hong Kong-based media company, and uh, this we are going through every single script that we have, trying to find the one that is the best suited so it doesn't offend anyone in China. Now we're at why are self Chinese, why are Chinese citizens so easy to offend? What what is no? That? It's not the citizens. It's the it's government. The government. Of course it is. You know. Listen, what's happening in the Ukraine is the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. I mean, it, it, I'm scared shitless about all this. Um, I worked with Russians working with James Cameron from 2000 to 2005. On the boats. On the boats. The yeah. It's a Russian ship. Uh, Mstislav Academic, excuse me, I can't pronounce it right. Academic Mstislav Keldish is the largest science vessel in the world, and it's Russian. Now, at the time, those guys were awesome. Those were all of our friends. They were normal people. They put on their pants, jeans, shirts. That, you know, they were just normal, everyday folks that don't give a shit about politics. Very blue collar. Very blue collar. You know, science guys mm -hmm. don't care about politics. All of them, most of them, hated Putin anyway. But um, you know, I'm I'm ran, I'm I'm on a tangent. That's Bring okay. me back in. <laughs> well, so how how's this related to China? Oh, China. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, Again, it, it's about censorship, and it's you know it's about what the Chinese government feels is good for their country, and we censor that. So, how do we? How, what would a perfect Chinese movie be these days? Like, how, how would you doctor up a movie to be pro-Chinese? What would that look um, like exactly? No, I well, I mean, just look at characters uh, and well, yeah, Mulan. Mm -hmm. It's a Chinese character. And it has to deal with a, a woman, you know, battling the forces of evil. Mm -hmm. Even Marvel, Shang Chi, the Ten Rings. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, as long as you're not showing the Chinese government in a bad light, you can do almost anything you want. Interesting. So, let's talk a little bit about um, the gun handling incidents that we've seen coming out of Hollywood. So uh, the most recent one was Alec Baldwin and Helena Hutchins. I yeah, pronounced her, her name. Yeah, it's um, sad. Terrible. And then it went. The bullet went through her and hit um, the producer, the Joel, director. The director. Uh, he may have been the producer. I, I know yeah. him to be the director. A uh, director, maybe yeah. his director, so, uh, Sozo. Yeah. Um, so do you have any uh, information about that? But also, you were there when. Uh, the other incident with Brandon Lee happened. I, I yes, I worked on the movie The Crow. Yeah. So um, I I was a special effects assistant, um, PA, uh, but I did special effects because it was a non-union film in Wilmington, North Carolina. My job was I had a little sledgehammer and I would walk up and down the the hose lines because it, if you ever saw The Crow, the first one, it took place mostly in the rain. Mm -hmm. So my job was to make sure, you know, we were shooting in February, so the lines were freezing. Mm -hmm. And when the lines freeze, you don't get rain. And Alex Perry is the director, when he yells action, we want rain. So it was my job to smack the, uh, the hose lines with my little sledgehammer. Very simple job. Mm -hmm. I didn't have anything to do with guns or bullets or anything like that. But I did work in that department. Mm -hmm. So um, from, from what... Uh, the, what I know from all of the information that we got while we were shooting the movie, um, it was it, it was an accident, um, but it was an accident that could have been resolved if the prop master who was handling the gun would have looked down the barrel of the gun and noticed that there was a piece of a fake bullet that broke off into the gun. And uh, unfortunately, that didn't happen. It was sort of a series of things. Um, so, you know, first the, he didn't look down the barrel to see if there was a piece of broken shrapnel stuck in there. Uh, then the next thing is the, the gun was handed to the actor and the actor pointed at Brandon. Now, don't, you don't need to point a gun at an actor, especially when you're off camera. I mean, he was, he was sort of off camera because I, I think they wanted to see the smoke of the, the, the pop of the, the bullet. 
uh, uh, not the bullet, but the uh, the black powder mm -hmm. drifts kind of in front of the camera. Give it a little special effect thing. And uh, so he pointed it at Brandon, and, and it, he was way off camera. So uh, we put a squib in the grocery bag, and uh, one of our special effects guys was behind a wall. And he, you know, uh, so they yell action. Um, Brandon comes out with a grocery bag, dialogue, dialogue, and then bang. Now, uh, when the bang hit, uh, from, what I, from what I'm told is that the uh, medic looked at Brandon's eyes and he saw something was, was wrong. So uh, the medic this runs- This isn't just acting. No, this isn't just acting. So, but it, this is really confusing moment for somebody who's have, watching that. Like, oh, that's a great acting well, no, job. He's well, laying there on the well, ground for here, a while and everyone's some, clapping. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> here, here's some interesting things is that, so uh, Brandon drops to the ground, medic runs into the shot. Uh, Alex Proyas has heard, you know, get out of my shot, get out of my shot, you know? And the medic's ripping his clothes and then the special effects guy comes out behind the wall and he, he was like excited because he thought he did the right timing on the squib. So when the grocery bag exploded, it was like the squib hit the right time. Everything happened the way it did. He just didn't see what was happening until he came out from behind the wall. And uh, it, it was one of the most traumatic moments of my life to ever be a part of a, a, a film where an actor died. So why is this happening? Why is this happening twice? Why? Why? Well, the, seemed, if you I remember, can, I, the crow was shot in 1997. Yeah, but, but yeah. I feel like Hollywood learned it should have learned its lesson. Why? Why did the? Holly, you know, most of Hollywood learned its lesson. Now, uh, talking about Rust, I only know what I read in the news. Well, you have you have some pretty good insights. I though. have. <laughs> I, well, yeah. I mean, first of all. Um, why there were live rounds allowed anywhere near that set, or people with guns and live rounds anywhere near that set, just boggles my mind. I mean, when we were on The Crow, we had, I mean, we had one scene where I think we went through 10,000 rounds. Ba -ba 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 -boom, you know, and I, he was standing on a table and he's getting shot by all the bad guys. Nothing ever happened with that, because mm -hmm. we had like four handlers and armorers and all of those guns and all that ammo was locked in a giant truck, and that truck is driven away at the end of each day. And no, there's no, you know, actors going and, hey, let's go shooting after work, you know. None of that stuff took place because it was a, you know, for me, it was a professional set. Um, but with Russ, I, again, it just sounds like there was a lot of inexperience. Hmm. And um, the producers should have had a much better handle on what was going on. Um, the armorer didn't have the experience she needed to do the job. I mean, yeah, her, I hear her father was a very famous armorer, I mean, like lots of experience. Why didn't they hire him? Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's pure, no. purely you pay for what, uh, you get what you pay for kind uh, of situation? You know what, listen, I, again, I don't know mm -hmm. the entire story, but based on just superficial information that the, the news reports, it just sounds like there was a lot of incompetence and a lot of inexperience that was going around. That's a shame. You know, I mean, I, I've worked on set with lots of guns before, and... You know, you will have one gun. You literally are handed one gun, you know. The producer should have been standing there on set and had a little folding table and you put the gun on the folding table and have the producer, line producer, anybody, any other producer, have three or four people check the freaking gun. Yep. And that's sort of what happens now. But I, again, with Rust, I have, I, I'm just, I'm sad that that all took place. But in a lot of ways, it will help hopefully remember you know allow our industry to remember that we work in a dangerous field mm -hmm, sure do yeah For all kinds of reasons yeah i mean i worked I mean, on how many a, times has jackie chan broken a i worked limb. on a movie <laughs> called dinosaur where we had a grip you know die because he got electrocuted he had a cherry picker he went through uh, uh wires uh power lines because he he didn't he couldn't see the where the power lines were and he hit them and he died so i mean we, we, as Hollywood, I take my job very, very, very seriously. So all safety protocols are involved. Everything is established, and I'll be a dick about it if I have to. Yeah. So one thing I think that was kind of weirdly interesting about that particular thing, if you're, if you're going to learn two lessons, one is one about safety, but the other one was about the fact that the bullet went through somebody and went through the next person. 
And this is something that Hollywood seems to consistently always get wrong. You always see the person jumping out in front of them heroically, getting shot, and the person behind them is like, oh, you saved my life, sort of. It's yeah, a nice but story. The guy was supposed to be empty. No, no, <laughs> I know, I know, I realize. But, uh, but, it, but that's what bullets actually do. Bullets yeah. continue to go until yeah. they run out of energy. But there's a lot of problems very similar to that in Hollywood. Like, uh, very often you'll see space movies where people are, you know, having shootouts and there's all these laser sounds or whatever. Right. Uh, or you'll see um, somebody driving a uh, two-stroke motorcycle back in the 80s, but it sounds like a four-stroke because they just overlaid some sound on top of it. The sound engineer just changed it completely. Um, there's all kinds of examples like that. <clears throat> Biomedicine, hacking. Oh, my God, don't get me started on all these terrible <laughs> hacking movies. So, like, what what's wrong with Hollywood? Why is it con so consistently very wrong about basically any technical detail? Like, why why aren't they hiring people who actually know what they talk well, they're talking about? I, I think you're generalizing, first I, of all. I am, but not by much. I think it's, well, uh, <laughs> Alyssa, you don't have to go far. <laughs> you'll be surprised. That there are a lot of films that are made that they hire experts and they follow the rules. But you also remember, you know, it's... Are these it's, just the wrong experts? or No, but a lot of times it's made for dramatic effect. A lot of times, it may, you know, this pen may be black now, but you know what? For the movie, we're going to make it purple and blue. But it's supposed to be black. It doesn't matter. We're, it's, it's what we're doing. Is we're doing creative uh, changes to it. And most of the time, I do think Hollywood, you know, does try to follow most of the, some of those rules. I realize I'm an outlier, but I find a lot of those movies to be kind of unwatchable in a way. You know, it's like I <laughs> well, really have to suspend disbelief. Like, you do, yeah. Significantly, though. But I think... Well, you watch a Marvel movie lately? I mean... Well, <laughs> yeah, but that's a little different. I mean, that's like supernatural. Okay, I can... The metaphysical or supernatural. I, I can... Right. I can suspend disbelief for the purpose of that, but... I mean, do guns suddenly get worse in this universe? Like, what happens? Well, all right, so maybe there, there are some other reasons that could be, too, is mm -hmm. that um, if you're doing a low-budget movie, maybe you can't afford to hire the exact expert, so you do screw up a few things. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you don't have enough money in the budget to hire the right sound people to actually go out and create the exact sound you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. When we did Expedition Bismarck for Jim Cameron, uh, we hired a sound company, which, by the way, won the Emmy for sound, best sound in television on that show. They went out and they literally recreated every single sound in Expedition Bismarck. When you watch that TV show, the sound is exceptional, beyond you, anything you'd ever imagine. And uh, so going against what you're saying, mm -hmm. they took the time and we had the budget to go out and make the sounds real. So and, and the just rest of the time, there's just somebody clanging well, in a just, basement somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. But no, I mean, listen, again, it depends on who you're working with, who the producers are, how much time and money they want to spend to make it as accurate as possible. And sometimes you don't have to because, well, it's make-believe for the most part. Yeah, got it. So one thing I think is kind of interesting is there's been a lot of really bad controversies coming out of Hollywood, specifically the actors, and it's all kinds of random things, often sexual, but it could also just be some racist comment or whatever. I want to know how seriously, if at all, the people are starting to look to where the future, because I'm not so interested in where we are, almost ever. I'm always trying to think of where things are going. I just don't see a world where we have actors and actresses anymore. I, I think they're going to go away. Not because people don't like acting and, and, uh, and showcasing their skills or whatever, but they're a liability. So from the business side, because you're a, you're a line producer, you can see the, the, the pros and cons of this. If I told you I could create something for a tenth the cost of the actor's fees, and you could you shoot hundreds of movies with this new character over and over again, perfect sound, looks picture perfect, uh, but got a great voice, you know, not a real person, but doesn't really matter in all shapes or forms. It's never going to do anything that you didn't write it to do. Why wouldn't you say, you know what, we should probably start moving in that direction, just getting rid of the traditional actor and actress? Because AI doesn't have true emotion. Yet, Chris. Okay. Oh, Yet. You asked me a question, <laughs> I answered it. AI, you, you know, AI can't, you know, 
give you an actual human response. Only This is only a matter of time, Chris. Of course, we're, it, we're maybe only... it is. Well, you know what? We're not there yet. When we get there, then we can talk about it. Okay, but, but let's, say, let's say we're there. Let's say we're, we're 10 years down the line and 10. we have... How about like 50 or 100? Whatever, whatever yeah. the number is. Right. Then, okay. Then you, you think there's still going to be actors and actresses? Well, or? of course there will be. Think so? Yeah, because you're, you're still going to need uh, understanding of how human beings operate. I mean, I, I don't... No, I'm not talking about uh, some person who's in a suit walking around with bulbs on them. I'm talking right. about an actual actor or actress. Well, then how, you know, the AI is going to have to mirror something. So let's say that, you know, I want to do an AI with like a Sigourney Weaver for aliens, mm -hmm. you know. It's Sigourney, it's modeling. You mm -hmm. still need a human being to do that. Mm -hmm. You still, you still you need don't. to model it to you, someone. You don't, you don't. I mean... You're only thinking about what's text there today. What about in the future where I can do all that stuff? And that's just a matter of me saying, hey, I want my character to do these five things and crouch and look right. scared. And Well, then when we come to that point, let's have this discussion again. Okay. All right. Because right now, uh, I, I, we need actors as much as actors need us. I think it's just a matter of time, my friend. Uh, <laughs> I know. I disagree. Re really just yeah. think it is. Okay. All right, so tell me about your new company. So you've got a new oh. production company. Well, I have a new old, old new production company. Newish. Okay. Newish. Well, I moved to Texas, so I moved. The, I dissolved the company in California, and I moved it to Texas. Got it. Uh, it's called Civilized Entertainment. Um, originally, it was called Human Entertainment. Mm -hmm. That was something John Cameron and I were putting together. Mm -hmm. But when John passed away, uh, I felt it was in a, it was no longer appropriate. So I changed it to civilized. Now, civilized for me has a multiple meanings. Um, working in reality TV for 20 years, um, what, what, I, what Tara and I started at E1, to me, was what I want civilized to be. Because the first couple of years we started, we were the company everyone wanted to work for. Because we were nice, we were fair, we, we didn't micromanage, we, we hired people that were experts at what they did and let them do it. And professional. So, and professional. Mm -hmm. And it was a great environment uh, that everyone wanted Security to be Security of the website left a little to be desired, but... <laughs> well, now that wasn't my control. I, I had my own division I had to deal with. So, but for me, civilized entertainment just doesn't mean like we're, we're doing, you know, my goal is to do projects that deal with science, technology, health, historical, medical. I mean, you know, I, I want to do things that can contribute some to the world. Excuse me, entertainment, absolutely. I wanted it to be entertaining, but I also wanted it to be somewhat meaningful in, in some capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition, you know, so it's two, twofold. You know, I'm going to do meaningful content that, mean, that will, you know, propel the human story forward. But I also want to provide a safe working environment and a fun working environment mm -hmm. and a professional working environment and, and something that has good energy about it. Because to me, Civilized Entertainment is the company everybody wants to work for. That's great. So you have a new coalition you're building as well. Uh, I, so moving to Texas, mm -hmm. um, I I love, I stay busy. I can't sit still. I have to stay busy. <laughs> so um, I reviewed the uh, Texas uh, Film and Television Tax Incentives. Mm -hmm. And, well, for the most part, there are none. I mean, they have low caps on everything, and you have to go through all these different, jump through a lot of hoops. So in a lot of ways, a lot of productions don't want to come to Texas because technically speaking, you know, in their view, they don't have the kind of credits that are necessary. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm forming the Texas Media Coalition that is going to take a look at uh, restructuring the entire uh, Texas Film Commission, uh, Tex Incentives. Um, I've done many movies in many states where we did, uh, where we we didn't structure, but we use their tax incentives, and they work. They work great. So I was going to cherry pick, basically, all the best things about several states across the country and try to mold a new and different tax incentive program for Texas that doesn't take away money for, for social issues, that doesn't take away from money from, let's say, occupancy tax, but that will actually generate more business for the state of Texas and bring more business into the state of Texas and keeping the tax incentives that we're generating from the film and television industry, giving those tax incentives to Texas businesses. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's just generating more for the state of Texas. 
And and so describe why it's so important to have these. Like, what what's the difference between having them and not having them? Well, it, it's economic development. Um, you know, I, I'm going to I'll take you out of the country for one second to Ireland. Uh, we did the Green Night in Ireland, and Ireland probably has the best tax incentives in the world. It's like somewhere between 32 to 36 percent cash back. So if you have a, a budget of ten million dollars, they're going to write you a check. You know, depending on how much. You know, if let's say you spend the entire ten million dollars, you're going to check, get a check back for like you know three million bucks. Mm -hmm. And they do it. It worked. We learned that on the Green Knight. I, that's part of the reason why I felt the Green Knight was one of the best movies I ever worked on, because it, everything just worked like a machine. It was amazing. So uh, obviously, in the U.S., we have a lot more complicated issues than that, but we shouldn't. I think I can figure out a way to move money around, and call it soft dollars, and keep all the money in the state, but then generate more business and bring it into the state. Um, I'm still working that out. Yeah, so who's interested in this? Who, who are you talking to? A film commissioner? Like who? Uh, I'm talking to, I basically have spoken to all the film commissioners in the state of Texas, you know, Houston, Austin, uh, San Antonio, uh, the actual Texas Film Commission itself. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the places that I'm going to is oil and gas. I have some relationships with some very large oil and gas companies in Texas. So I want to go to them with a proposal to somehow keep it all in the state. And it'll propel film and television as well as, you know, just business. And, you know, if, if I can sell tax incentives to a restaurant that, you know, instead of, uh, I, I can't really even get into it because I, I don't know enough about taxes and the way the tax structure is in Texas. That's what I'm learning. A lot of property tax. <laughs> a lot of property tax, but, but I'm learning how to do that. And I'm going to see how that incorporates into the little program I'm creating. So how do people support you? How do they get behind this or get behind what you're doing? Well, um, Civilize, how, they, how do they yeah, find you? I, you know, CivilizedEntertainment.com. It's real simple. Mm -hmm. um, we have an email address, CivilizedEntertainment at Gmail. Uh, you know, send me notes. Uh, we're looking for endorsements from uh, corporations, companies uh, that we can generate uh, so that I can I can help your business with whatever taxes you're paying uh, by bringing in more business from Hollywood and, and just keeping everybody busy. I mean, that's why I, I have a problem saying still. So I want to keep myself busy. <laughs> and I also want to work. You know, if you know, uh, if I can create more jobs here in the state of Texas for you know film and television, then I will. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. And then we're uh, also creating a training program too. Uh, I, you know, going back to Ireland, they have something called the. Uh, it's called the trainees. So uh, the st the country of Ireland puts a, a trainee on in e every department on whatever movies they do, and they subsidize. So, it's a great I would, way to get like small local organizations well, yeah, you, involved. you build, yeah, you, you basically you build a base of crew. Mm -hmm. So if you have a, a PA or a trainee in every department, and you do three, uh, you know that trainee does this show and that show and that show. They do three. After the third show, then they get accepted into the union, and now you just build your base, mm -hmm. you, and that keeps going and going and going. Ireland can shoot like you know hundred movies if you want all around the country because they have a very large base of crew. Right. So if we can try to do something like that with Texas, like say the universities, use all the university film and you know television programs that they have, and incorporate them into the training program when they graduate. There you go. It's a great way to get a lot of local businesses involved as well. Oh, absolutely. They, well, it comes back to them. You know, absolutely. now they're getting stuff shot in their city, and their kids are sure. involved in the program. Well, um, I want to bring up one thing. I, I got a question from an IBL follower. Uh -huh that said, what are the current COVID protocols now dealing with yeah, our industry? Yeah, yeah. Well, currently, they're, they kind of are still the same. They, you know, the unions sort of dictate what those are. Um, and they really haven't changed all that much. They still do rapid testing. They still do masks. They do PCRs, depending on what is a requirement from each studio, from each network, et cetera. And this is mostly um, insurance related, I'm sure. Uh, well, it's COVID mm -hmm. related. It's health related. Mm -hmm. We want to keep everybody safe on set. Sure. So. That's kind of uh, where uh, the business is now. But I hear by the end of April, the unions may be changing their, their tune a little bit, which would be good. Great. So. Well, do you have a social media profile that people should follow you at? Uh, civilized uh, Facebook, Civilized Twitter, Civilized all that. You know, just Great. look Civilized. It's at Civilized, <laughs> I think. Actually, here, I'll look at my card. How about that? <laughs> I'm, I'm not the best social media guy. Yeah, Facebook is at Civilized. Twitter is at Civilized. Okay. 
Instagram is at Civilized Entertainment. All right. Well, thank so. you so much for coming on the Arstay Show. I really appreciate it. Both uh, this conversation as well as your help with producing the show. Thanks, thank Robert. Thank you so much. Yeah, appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank you.